welcome to chapter 10 on muscle tissue the learning objectives of this chapter is for us to understand the anatomy and physiology of a muscle tissue we will study the organization of muscles we'll study the three main types of muscles skeletal cardiac and smooth muscle we We'll study muscle contraction and relaxation. We'll talk about um, the energy use in a muscle, the metabolism in a muscle. You'll be able to explain uh, how the nervous system controls uh, muscle contraction. And we'll conclude with uh, the connection between exercise and muscle performance. So what are the main functions of skeletal muscle? So 40% of your body mass comes in general from muscles. Words that start with myo, my, sarco, they all refer to muscles. They bring about movement in the body. So the, the, we saw how the bones and the joints, they will, uh, when the muscle contracts, you know, it acts as a lever to bring about body movement. So you're able to do things, use your hands and walk and run and dance all because of your muscles, because they pull on the bones to bring about the movement. They are very important for your body posture and body position. Your muscles will protect all the soft internal organs. For example, you know, the muscles of your abdomen is protecting your liver, your spleen, all the delicate organs in the abdominal regions. They will guard entrances and exits. So these are circular muscles called sphincters. Uh, because cellular respiration and breaking down of glucose is happening in the muscles, they play a huge role in maintaining body temperature because uh, heat is uh, given off during cellular respiration. And they also like serve as a storage of nutrients like glycogen, fat, uh, some minerals too. So what is the unique traits of muscles? Muscles exhibit uh, excitability. That means it can receive a stimulant. In this picture, we are seeing a nerve, an action potential is fired along the nerve and it is transferring the message or the command to the muscle, asking it to contract. So this phenomena is called excitability or irritability. So the muscles are able to receive and respond to stimuli. And the muscle in response is contracting. So the ability to shorten. So this is like ATP, all these dots you're seeing is the ATP requirement that's needed for muscle contraction. So muscle tissues can extend. So extension doesn't need energy. And elasticity also. So it's able to rebound and return to the original uh, resting position. So excitability, contractability, extensibility, elasticity, they are all unique traits of muscle tissue. There are three types of muscle tissue. We uh, talked about it when we studied tissues. Uh, so we have the skeletal muscle tissue, which are attached to the skeletal system of your body. And it, it is allowing you to move and manipulate objects. So if you see, it has the striated appearance. And you can see it has more than one nuclei. So it's multinucleate. It is voluntary. The smooth muscle, they are like spindle shaped and they're found in the walls of hollow internal organs like blood vessels, the GI tract, your uterus. They are uninucleate and they are involuntary. The cardiac muscle, you can see it's very unique. They are branched, they are uninucleate. It's involuntary, found only in the heart and it will have this unique intercalated disc and they will exhibit uh, autorhythmicity so they can develop uh, action potential uh, by themselves. So this you can find in the heart. 
how our muscles are organized. So if you take a muscle, you know, like let's say you take a bicep muscle, so that would be an organ made up of different tissues. The muscle in turn is made up of a bundle of muscle cells. It's called fascicle. A muscle cell, because it's so long, it is called as a muscle fiber. And then you zoom into a muscle cell, you'll see all these uh, cylindrical uh, units of proteins called myofibrils. They in turn are made up of myofilaments. Actin is the thin one, myosin is the thick uh, protein. So from the smallest to the largest, it is myofilaments, myofibrils, my myofiber, fascicle, and the muscle. So uh, the muscle is protected by connective tissue. So here's a muscle. So like you uh, zoom into any muscle here, the connective tissue that protects the muscle on the outside is called epimysium. Epi means on top of. It is a thick uh, fibrous collagen layer and it's connected to the internal deep fascia and it separates the muscle from all the surrounding tissue. So you can see the outside protective covering is called epimysium. The protective covering of the bundle of muscles called fascia is called perimysium. So you can see our uh, blood supply and nerves here. Endomysium surrounds an individual muscle fiber. And this is under the control of a, a nerve also. It will be innervated. So all these epimysium, perimysium, and endomysium will all run together to form a tough tendon that will attach the muscle to the uh, bone. So if, if it is tight and if it looks like a rope, it's a tendon. If it is a flat sheet, it's called as a aponeurosis. So you can see this in our skull also, and here in the abdomen, you can see aponeurosis, which is a flat sheet of tendon. So how is the muscle organized? So the muscle is very vascular. It has a very rich blood supply. The muscles, skeletal muscles are voluntary and they are controlled by nerves of your brain and spinal cord. Uh, a very important phenomena is, uh, see, how do muscles form? So the muscle fiber develops through fusion of mesodermal cells called myoblast. So many myoblasts will come together and they fuse to form this long cylindrical cell. That's why it is multinucleate. And these little cells called myocytes, uh, myosatellite cells, they are stem cells. They are totipot or multipotent. And they, are, um, they have very little cytoplasm and they are the precursors of uh, muscle cells. So when you zoom into the structure of a muscle fiber or a muscle cell, it will have all the components of a regular cell, you know, a cell membrane, a cytoplasm, mitochondria, but they are called by different names. For example, the cell membrane of a muscle cell is called sarcolemma. The cytoplasm is called sar sarcoplasm. The endoplasmic reticulum will be called a sarcoplasmic reticulum. And you can see how the a sarcolemma dips into the cell to form something called transverse tubule or T-tubule. So thereby it can take the message or the action potential from the outside to inside the cell asking the muscle to contract when it gets the signal. One unit of muscle contraction. So you can see uh, this is a sar um, muscle fiber or muscle cell and then it, is, it has a lot of myofibril. So these are the bundles of proteins, the actin and myosin proteins. So here's a myofibril. And then you can see the thin filament and the thick filament alternate 
thick filament is thick. That's why it's called thick. It's uh, made of protein myosin. And thin filament is actin. So one unit of muscle contraction is called as a sarcomere. And um, the baby blue is the modified sarcoplasmic reticulum. And um, it has a terminal cisternae, which can be a reservoir of calcium. So these are the flattened uh, membranous vesicles. So they will have, they are rich in calcium and they can um, release calcium uh, bef uh, when a contraction uh, is going to happen. So we can also see a lot of mitochondria because we need a lot of ATP energy for muscle contraction. Sarcolemma, T-tubule. See the junction of a T-tubule and the two uh, terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum this is called as a triad. You can see a myofibril, which is a bundle of uh, thick and thin uh, proteins that bring about muscle contraction. So sarcomere is one unit of muscle contraction. So if you take a myofibril, there'll be like thousands and hundreds of sarcomeres. So if you look deep into a sarcomere, you can see the arrangement, the alternate arrangement of thick and thin filaments. The A band, the A band, so right in the center here, is a dark band. And you can see here that the thick and the thin filaments, both of them are found. H band right in the center is only thick filaments. And so every band is actually a protein. So M line is a protein. So the M line is right in the middle, M middle. Then we have the A band. The I band is here. It's the light band, and then you can see only thin filaments here. Z bands, that, that's going zigzag, are the boundary between the adjacent sarcomeres. H zone will have only thick filaments. And here's the zone of overlap. So you can see thick and thin. And this is the most important site, the zone of overlap. And the green squiggly lines that you're seeing is a protein called Titan. And it's also referred to as, as a molecular spring. And it's responsible for the uh, rebound or the elastic nature of muscles. So this picture in the bottom is showing a cross section of the protein structure in the different uh, bands. So the I band, you can see only thin and tighten. In M line, you can only see thick and the uh, M protein and so forth. So this is the cross-sectional view of the protein structure that is found in the different bands. This is a very good summary slide of everything we spoke about. So if you take any muscle like a bicep or tricep, any muscle, it is protected by epimysium. Muscle is made up of bundles of muscle cells called fascicles. The protective layer of fascicles is called perimysium. So you can see a lot of arteries and veins in both these layers. The muscle fiber or the muscle cell is made up of myofibrils and it is uh, uh, protected by endomysium. You zoom into a myofibril you can see the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, the T-tubule that is going to bring in the message from outside the cell to deep inside the cell. You can see the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then here is one unit of muscle contraction, which is called as a sarcomere. It is made up of alternating thin and thick filaments. Thin is shown in red, thick is shown in blue. And Titan is keeping it all together. Z lines are the boundaries. M line is right in the center. And here's the zone of overlap. So we have to uh, master an understanding of how um, the molecules inside a myofibril is arranged. We need, we need to understand this. Only then we'll be able to understand how the muscle contracts. 
So let's look at the two main proteins of muscle contraction. So here, if you zoom into the thin filaments or actin filaments, here we can zoom it out, you can see that in turn is actually made up of four different proteins. F, actin is a filamentous protein. It looks like two strands of pearls, two strands of beads that are twisted past each other. And they have an active site on the G, actin strand. So they have an active site here. And the active site is actually uh, blocked. Nebulin is the protein that holds the two uh, globular protein strands together. Tropomyosin is a double-stranded protein. It looks like a rope on top of the beads. And it's uh, blocking the active site. So it's right there. And troponin is the specific protein that will bind to tropomyosin, which is that blue, blue strand. And it's uh, together when the strand is uh, in a certain position, it is blocking the active site in the globular protein. So if you have to expose the active site, we have to roll this tropomyosin troponin complex to expose it. So actin or the thin filament is made up of four different proteins. Among this, the two important ones that you have to remember are the troponin and tropomyosin. So now let's look at the thick filaments, how they look, uh, uh, the molecular structure of thick filaments. So here too, they are held together. See the titan is holding a bundle of thick filaments together. And if you uh, study one thick filament or myosin molecule, it has a tail. It has a hinge region and a myosin head, which is made up of two globular protein subunits. So during a contraction, this myosin head can reach out and it, it, it can interact with the active site in uh, the actin molecule and it can form a cross bridge, this head. It can be energized to form a cross bridge and then it can push the uh, uh, thin filament towards the M line, thereby bringing about a contraction. So sliding filament theory, uh, they, uh, the, the, the group of scientists who discovered it, they got a Nobel Prize. So this is talking about the mechanism of muscle contraction based on muscle proteins that will slide past each other in order to bring about the movement. So you can see how the zone of overlap during a contraction is like reduced. So the Z lines move closer to the M line, thereby bringing about a shorting of the muscle fiber. So the muscle fiber will contract when the myosin filaments pull the actin filaments closer and thereby shortening the sarcomere. So when all the sarcomeres in the muscle fiber shorten, the whole muscle fiber will shorten. So this happens when the thick filaments and the thin filaments slide across each other towards the M line. So for a muscle to contract, it needs to get a message from the, it is under neural control. So this is actually the end of a neuron. So you can see the axon that ends uh, in the uh, synaptic terminal. And here's the synaptic bulb. The nerve cell and the muscle cell are not touching. There is a gap called synaptic cleft. So here in the picture on the left, you can see the axon of the motor neuron that is bringing in the command or the action potential. And when the action potential reaches the uh, synaptic bulb, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine will be packaged in Golgi vesicles and it is released in the synaptic cleft. This acetylcholine will, will find a receptor in the receiving muscle cell. So this region is called as the motor end plate. So all the receptors are here. So when acetylcholine finds the receptor in the motor end plate, 
it will open the um, sodium channels and sodium will flood in thereby changing the permeability of the muscle cell. So that is called depolarization. So the message from the neuron has now jumped into the uh, muscle cell. So after the message is transmitted, acetylcholine will be broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that is found in the synaptic cleft. Thereby the muscle can relax. So it's called excitation contraction coupling. So here acetylcholine finds a receptor and when sodium floods in, it excites the muscle cell. The sodium in turn will command the release of calcium from the cisternae of a sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium will dislocate the troponin tropomyosin complex, thereby exposing the active site. And then the thick and the thin filaments will interact with each other and they will slide past each other and the Z lines will move closer to the M line, bringing about a muscle contraction. So this picture is an overview of uh, sliding filament theory. We'll look into the details as to how this happens. So here, this is a picture that shows how uh, Golgi apparatus is going to pack neurotransmitters called acetylcholine in vesicles. So the vesicles will fuse with the plasma membrane of the synaptic cleft region, and then it will spill the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine will find a receptor in the motor end plate and when that ligand and the reception happens, it will open the sodium channels and the sodium will flood into the muscle cell. Once the message from the neuron enters the muscle, the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft will be broken down by acetylcholine esterase. So the message has transferred from the neuron into the muscle cell. So in the muscle cell, there are six main um, events that happen for a contraction to happen. So the sodium that's flooding into the muscle cell and causing depolarization will trigger the release of calcium from the cisternae of sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when Calcium arrives at the zone of uh, overlap, the contraction cycle begins. So you can see the actin filaments and the myosin filaments here. The calcium will dislocate the troponin tropomyosin complex, exposing the active site. It's called active site exposure. So when that's happening, you can see how the myosin head is energized. So you can see how ATP is broken down to ADP and phosphate, and then it is come into position, lining up with the active site. So when calcium dislocates and exposes the active site, it forms a cross bridge. So it, the neck pivots and it anchors to the active site. So it's called cross bridge formation. So this is the interaction between the myosin head and the active site. And after it binds, the myosin head will pivot towards the M line. After it pivots, all of the, all the heads will pivot at the same time. It will push the Z line towards the M line. And after that is done, the cross bridge, uh, this is called power stroke when it's pivoting. After it pivots and does the power stroke, the cross bridge will detach and then it is ready for, uh, it, it relaxes. And then it will wait for the next signal to come in for a muscle contraction. So these are the six steps of muscle contraction. So this picture is showing how the muscle fiber uh, can shorten and contract. So the sarcomeres will shorten and the muscle will pull together producing a lot of tension. So this can either happen in one end or both ends depending on how the muscle is attached. 
So after the muscle contracts and after the acetylcholine esterase breaks down the acetylcholine, the calcium concentration will form, will fall. The calcium will detach from the troponin and the muscle will relax. At death, when the muscles are fixed in contraction, it is called rigor mortis because uh, the muscles have ran out of ATP and the calcium concentration will uh, build up in the muscle cells. This is a summary slide as to uh, explaining um, muscle sliding filament theory. So here is the axon, the action potential or the command, bringing in the command, asking the muscle to contract. So this is the synaptic terminal. The receiving end of the muscle with all the receptors is called motor end plate. When acetylcholine is released, it will bind to the receptor. The action potential is uh, triggered in the membrane. It will reach the T-tubule. The T-tubule will reach the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, depolarization would have happened and calcium is released. Calcium will bind to the troponin tropomyosin complex, exposing the active site. And then the contraction begin. The sliding filament theory will kick in right here. And after the muscle contracts, the acetylcholine is broken down. The sarcoplasmic reticulum will recapture the calcium. The active sites are covered and there are no cross bridge interaction and the contraction will end. So this is, these are the main events one to nine as to how a contraction starts and ends. So what is a motor unit? So motor unit, see every muscle cell is under the control of a motor neuron. So a motor unit consists of a motor neuron. So here's the spinal cord and all the muscle fibers in it innervates. For example, the purple neuron is going to innervate or it's going to control all the purple muscle fibers. The orange one is going to control all the muscle, the orange muscle fibers. So that is a motor unit. So one neuron can actually control hundreds of muscle fibers. And uh, motor units are either classified as slow twitch or fast. Uh, this type one and type two slow twitch, which is a fatigue resistant with small force or twitch tension created slow to contract. It has a lot of oxidative enzymes. Type two is fast uh, twitch, fatigue resistant, and there's both, there are two types here with larger forces of contraction, and they have both oxidative and glycolytic enzymes. Uh, muscle tone refers to the tension that develops in the muscles. There are two types of muscle contraction. In isotonic contraction, the skeletal muscle, uh, the length of the muscle will uh, change. In isotonic. In isometric, so this is like uh, when you're doing a bicep curl, you can see the bicep bunch up, so the length will change. Whereas in isometric, the muscle length does not change, but tension is developed. So this is this can be an example of when you're uh, like carrying your grocery bags or when you're pushing against a wall. So here in isotonic, change in length of muscle, here there's no change. So muscles are powered by ATP. So they need energy for contraction, adenosine triphosphate. So that's the active energy muscle. So they will undergo a metabolic reaction called cellular respiration in order to make ATP. Creatine phosphate refers to the storage molecule for, is the storage molecule for excess ATP. Our body makes ATP by using ADP and a phosphate molecule, an enzyme called creatine kinase. 
So there are two ways we can make ATP in a muscle cell. Aerobic would be aerobic respiration is when we use oxygen. Anaerobic is uh, without oxygen. So this is a picture of the cellular respiration pathway. You know, mitochondria is called as the powerhouse of the cell. So glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. So glucose, which is the main energy molecule in our body, will it's a six carbon compound and it'll break to two carbon compound called pyruvate. But this breaking, this happens in the cytoplasm of the cell and this is aerobic, anaerobic. So if our body wants ATP very quickly, then it'll it will go into anaerobic respiration and make glycolysis. It will it'll only make two molecules of ATP, but it's very quick. And then there is a transition state when pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, and then it will enter the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial matrix. So this is the mitochondria. And the citric acid cycle will produce only two ATPs. So this is aerobic. But both glycolysis and citric acid cycle will make electron carriers called NAD and FAD, which will drop off the electrons in the electron transport chain found in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And by chemiosmosis, there is a, a ATP synthase and the, a gradient will be formed here. And when hydrogen ions flows through ATP synthase, AT, ADP will be converted to ATP. So most of the energy will be made in the electron transport chain, like 32 to 34 molecules of ATP. So the electron transport chain is a series of uh, proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, so this overall mechanism is uh, called cellular respiration. So this is anaerobic glycolysis. All the other uh, stages are aerobic. What are the different types of muscle fibers? There's fast fibers, slow fibers. So you can see slow fibers, which are, they are slow to contract. And they're also slow to fatigue. That's why you, you are able to stand on your feet the whole day. They have smaller diameter, they have more mitochondria, they have high oxygen supply, and they will have the red uh, pigment myoglobin. So you can also think about red muscle fiber, like, like red meat, like chicken legs. They are slow to uh, fatigue. Whereas fast fibers, they will contract very quickly and they'll have a large diameter. They will have large glycogen reserves also, few mitochondria, and they have very uh, strong contractions. Good example would be like the white meat. In the human body, it is we have a combination of both uh, uh, slow and fast. They're called intermediate fibers. They are mid-sized. This is the most uh, prevalent. So muscles can uh, either undergo hypertrophy or atrophy. So hypertrophy refers to over de development of muscles. This comes with heavy strength training. Uh, there's increase in the diameter of muscle fibers and myofibrils, increased glycogen reserves. So this state is called hypertrophy. Atrophy is when we lose muscle because of lack of activity. Uh, the muscle size will reduce, the tone uh, will reduce, and it becomes weak. So we, uh, so this is muscle atrophy. Uh, we can see this like when uh, people get paralyzed, they stop using, they can't use their um, uh, limbs, and then it atrophies. Exercise is very important for us to maintain uh, the muscle tone. When you don't use the muscles, the muscle tone will reduce. So muscles will become flaccid because of inactivity. The muscle fibers will start to break. The proteins in the muscle will become weaker and smaller. So in order to maintain healthy muscles and healthy metabolism, uh, the muscle tone is very important. And that concludes our chapter and I hope that was helpful.